What is up everyone? Welcome to another Castlevania video. I know a lot of people want me to get back to Persona and SMT content, which I will, but seeing as how it is October, I want to focus on Castlevania as much as I can before the month is over. And what a better way to do that than to revisit one of my favorite Castlevania games, Circle of the Moon. Circle of the Moon is a very unique entry in the Castlevania series. It was the first game to take on a Metroidvania style after Symphony of the Night. It was a launch title for the Game Boy Advance. Its story doesn't tie into any previous games and it's not considered canon. It's one of the few games in this style that Koji Igarashi didn't work on, and it features a lot of unique mechanics that haven't been in any other game, like the DSS system. Fans seem to have a love it or hate it attitude towards it, and personally, I'm more on the love it side, but it has been almost a decade since I last played this game, so why not revisit it for a challenge? Only problem is, what would I do? Well, in some games, Konami included a mode where you can have your level permanently locked at 1. This is a really cool feature, but sadly they didn't think of this until 2006, and the only games that have it are Portrait of Ruin and Order of Ecclesia. However, I did figure out a way to do this for Circle of the Moon using Cheat Engine, but before I get into that, let's go over the rules. The first rule is that I have to play through the entire game with my level locked at 1. This doesn't mean, though, that it's going to be one at all times. I'll explain what I mean by this and why I'm doing it later in the video. The second rule is that I am not allowed to use save states or rewinds during boss battles. Lastly, I am going to ban the DSS glitch. Circle of the Moon has a very easy to exploit glitch where you can use any DSS card combo as soon as you get two cards, and I am not going to be using this. But anyway, let's get started. Can you beat Castlevania Circle of the Moon at level one? But first, a word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. I'm sure most of you have heard of it, but in case you haven't, Raid Shadow Legends is a free-to-play turn-based RPG that can be played on your iPhone, iPad, Android, or Windows PC. With over 600 champions and over a million different possible champion combinations, there are countless different angles to tackle raids, dungeons, boss battles, and PvP arenas. And considering that it's available for most mobile devices and can easily run on most laptops, plus, with it being playable offline, there's almost nowhere you won't be able to play it. My top three places to play this game are restaurants while I'm waiting on my food, during long and otherwise boring car rides, and on the plane. With Halloween being just around the corner, Raid is currently running a trick-or-treat promotion where you can win both in-game and real-life prizes, like a $1,000 Amazon gift card and some epic and legendary Halloween-themed champions. All you gotta do is download the game using the link down below in the description, and then follow the other link to trickortreat.playerium.com. You have until November 15th, so check it out while it's hot. Now is a great time to get into Raid Shadow Legends, and if you use the promo code DKRISES, you'll get a whole bunch of free items and one of your champions will automatically level up to 50. This code is available for both new and existing players until October 25th. And if you are a new player, you can sign up right now using the link down below in the description or use the QR code on screen. You will receive bonus items worth $30 in value, those being a free epic champion, Ina, 200,000 silver, one energy refill, one EXP boost, and one ancient shard. All this stuff will be waiting for you right here. I want to give a big thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to the video. Start up the Advanced Collection, choose Circle of the Moon, choose New Game, and watch the intro. In this game, Dracula gets resurrected by Carmilla, or I guess just Camilla in this game, literally seconds before the anti-Dracula squad gets there. Dracula immediately blasts a hole in the floor, sending both me, Nathan Graves, and Hugh Baldwin plummeting to the ground. And now, the game can begin. This is also where I lock my level at 1, and you do it with a program called Cheat Engine. What this program does is it lets you search for existing variables in your game and modify them while you play. I was originally going to have a separate segment in this video where I just showed you how to do it, but that ended up being way longer than I expected, so I'll just have a link below in the description to the tutorial on my second channel. But the short version is that you're going to be using Cheat Engine to search for the variables containing your EXP and level and lock them in place so that you don't level up. And once that's taken care of, we can start the challenge. Now, with this being the very beginning of the game, as expected, none of the enemies here are much of a problem. The skeleton bombers and zombies are going down in one hit, though surprisingly, the regular skeletons aren't. Kind of a bad sign considering I won't be leveling up, but there are other ways to increase my strength other than just leveling up in this game. 
It's actually quite a while before I get to a save point, mainly because I missed the earliest one, and also a while before I get to the boss. On my way there, I get the dash boots, which thankfully offset the slow movement in this game. I'm also going to need to go out of my way to collect every heart max, HP max, and MP max I have access to, because without the ability to level up, these are going to be my only means of increasing these stats. Before too long, I get to Cerberus, the first boss, and this boss is a little unpredictable at first, but it doesn't take long to figure out his attack pattern. The way he fights is that he'll alternate between three different attacks, and the one he's about to use corresponds with whatever color his body changes into. When he's blue, he'll release these walls of electricity that surround him. Even with the ridiculous range your whip has, you probably won't be able to hit him when he's doing this. So I recommend having the knife sub-weapon and hitting him with that while he does this. When he's a lighter blue, he'll just pounce at you. When you're on the ground, he'll only leap a short distance, but when you're on one of the platforms, he'll jump in the air across the arena, and this is also very hard to avoid. For this reason, I don't recommend using the platforms. And when he turns red, he'll jump across the stage, jump on one of the platforms, and then fire his laser. The jump can easily be avoided by just crouching, but the laser attack is very hard to avoid. As soon as he jumps over you, you have to immediately start running towards him so that you can be under him where his laser can't hit you. This is a great opportunity to land some hits, and if you're using the Mars and Salamander DSS combo, which you probably will have by now, your whip can deal even more damage. Normally it's only dealing 10, but with my DSS on, it's dealing 11 and 16 when it hits its sweet spot. I don't recommend trying to land this though because you have to be very close to him, which can be dangerous. Your best opportunities to deal damage are when he's using the electric attack, provided you have the knife, and the laser attack with the whip. One thing that's kind of annoying is that when he's in the process of changing colors, he's invincible. And he also has quite a lot of HP for an early game boss, but thankfully his attacks are pretty weak and taking him down isn't too much of a challenge. So I go to the next room, get the double jump necklace, and now I'm off to the next section of the castle, the Abyss Stairway, a place that requires a lot of platforming. I spend most of this part climbing the stairs, whipping the gargoyles, skeletons, skeleton soldiers, and whatever other variants of enemies are here. The only ones that really pose much of a threat are the axe armors, but on the way up I get some holy water, which helps a lot, and also the electric skeletons, which zap you with an attack that does a lot of damage, comes out very fast, and has a longer range than your whip, so I recommend just jumping over them. I mean, it's not like there's any point to grinding in this game, right? But again, I just fight through and jump over most of the enemies here, which isn't too hard until I get to the next boss, the Necromancer, one of the most cheap, frustrating, and unfair bosses in the entire game. And this is only the second one. Why is he cheap, frustrating, and unfair? Well, for one thing, this fight takes place in a very large arena, and this guy spends the entire battle flying around really fast. Unlike the fight against Cerberus, it's extremely hard to hit him with him constantly moving around. But on top of that, he surrounds himself with these little circles, which then become little donuts, which he flings at you in unpredictable patterns that also home after you. A lot of bosses in Castlevania do this, but what makes this one such a problem is that there doesn't seem to be any restriction on where he can fly and launch these things from. He just flies around and launches them from wherever he feels like, and more often than not, they'll come flying at you from off screen. How are you supposed to figure out his attack pattern to avoid his attacks when you can't even see them? There's nothing more frustrating than just trying to maneuver around only to have one of these things come flying from the top of the screen at 100 miles an hour and take away 15% of my health, which is another problem. My whips are only doing 4 damage, and each attack he does deals 21. And if that weren't bad enough, the window to hit him is very small, if you even can hit him. After doing his donut attack twice, he'll stop what he's doing to summon some zombies. He doesn't move when he does this, so it's a good opportunity to hit him but he just stops wherever he is and does it, which sometimes is in a place where you have to double jump just to take a swing at him, and sometimes it's inside the ceiling, and if that happens, you're screwed. I tried this boss for hours and didn't even come close to beating him. Sometimes I'd be doing good, only to then just get an unlucky streak where I'm bombarded with a bunch of projectiles I couldn't see coming and die, and that's what this boss is. It's not a test of skill or endurance, it's just luck. You might be asking, well, why not just go to the shop and buy a whole bunch of potions? Shop? What shop? There is no shop in Circle of the Moon. That's right, pretty much all the equipment you get, from armor to accessories to consumables to cards, all come from random drops from enemies. You can't even find weapons or equipment lying on the ground, and the drop rates in this game are not generous. 
I've heard stories of some people spending hours grinding enemies to get the accessories they need, and not only are potion drops a rare occurrence, they only restore 20 HP, which, even for the early game, is pretty pathetic. I did try to grind the Devil Towers for them since they're the only enemies around here that drop them, but after like 20 minutes of grinding, I only got one. So, what else can I do? Well, remember what I said earlier about not staying level 1 at all times? Well, in this game, your drop rate is affected by your luck stat. There are accessories that increase this, but the effects they have are negligible, and I don't have access to them this early anyway. But, using the same method I used to lock myself at level 1, I can also increase my level to whatever I want, and seeing as how with every level all my stats increase, including luck, if I level myself up to 99, that will greatly increase my chances of getting a potion and any droppable item. So, yeah, you can probably see where this is going. For purposes of RNG manipulation, I am going to allow myself to use Cheat Engine to modify my level, and therefore, my stats. I know how a lot of people feel about doing things like this, but ask yourself what's worse. Doing this, or spending hours upon hours upon hours grinding for weak HP restoratives and any other accessories or items that I may need later. I'm allowing this because all I'm really doing is speeding things up, but just so that I won't be tempted to use this to cheese my way through the harder parts of the game, I'm going to make it a rule that I can't do this in an area until I've gone all the way through. But anyway, I set my level to 99 and start grinding the Devil Towers, and even with my level this high, it still takes a while before I start seeing potions, and I think it's really telling about a game even when, at the max level, the odds are still pretty low. There doesn't seem to be any shortage of wristbands, though. I do this until I have 26 potions, which is a bit overkill, but at least I'll have some spares for fights later. I also remember that I can increase my damage with the Venus-Salamander combination, which increases my damage output, which in this case makes my damage go from 4 to 6, which isn't great, but with how much HP this boss has, it helps more than you'd think. It does drain MP, but thankfully your MP restores on its own over time. I also bring along the Crucifix Boomerang, which in this game is probably the best sub-weapon. It doesn't make a huge difference in this fight, but it will be a game changer later on. Other than what I said before, there's really not a lot to say. Just run around, hit him, and try to avoid his attacks as best you can. Although, once you beat him, you're still not done because he has a second phase. Yeah, only the second boss of this game, and we're already seeing bosses with two phases. Now, he flies around even faster and summons skeletons instead. I don't know if I'd say it's harder than the first phase, but it's a lot more annoying. His primary means of attack is where he transforms into this green ball and flies around diagonally. It's really hard to dodge if he does it off screen, but if you're close enough to him, it's actually pretty easy because more than likely it'll go under or over you. One thing that's annoying is that when you're trying to hit him on the ground, you have to deal with the skeletons and all their projectiles, but I don't actually recommend staying on the ground since you're more vulnerable to his ball attack there. I recommend you just stay on top of the platform as much as you can. Other than that, there's really not a lot to say. The only way to do it is to just do it. My reward for beating him is the tackle helmet, which lets me break those stone blocks. Not the wood ones, though. Yeah, apparently Nathan can now break stone, but isn't strong enough to push some wood. Well, weird game logic aside, this allows me to access the Machine Tower, a place full of moving platforms, gears, and annoying enemies like the Medusa Heads, although most of the enemies here aren't actually too bad. There are some upgrades hidden behind powerful enemies like the Rock Armors, but I can still easily deal with these guys by just using that spinny whip attack. Yeah, Nathan can't do that weird twirl thing that Richter can, but by holding B he will automatically swing the whip like a fan. Anyway, after a bunch of running and jumping, I do get to the top where I have to fight the next boss, the Iron Golem. Now, this thing is commonly considered the easiest boss in the game, and for a pretty good reason. He moves incredibly slowly, and his attacks are very predictable. One of them has him punch you, one has him throw some weird ball of energy at you, and one has him smash the ground, which will hurt you if you're standing on the ground, and will also cause gears to fall from the ceiling, which can damage you. One problem, though. He can heal! Yeah! It's not even, like, in a way where he'll stop what he's doing to heal or can only do it once or twice per battle. He'll just randomly start glowing and heal for a whole bunch of HP. 
five at a time, which is exactly how much damage my whip is doing with the Venus Salamander bonus. And he goes for this a lot, and I can't swing my whip fast enough to counter this. It doesn't matter how easy his attacks are to dodge. With the power to infinitely heal himself, this battle is impossible. In all my attempts, I try to deal damage as fast as I can, but when he starts to heal, it's not long before I start seeing zeros around him when he's doing this, meaning he's back to full health. I need to be able to attack more frequently, so can I? Well, remember what I said earlier about the boomerang being the best sub weapon in the game? It's because with the way it works, if you throw it at just the right spot and it hits them right where it turns around and comes back, it can hit the enemies three, four, sometimes even five times. And it's also the most powerful. It's the only way for me to deal damage to the golem at a fast rate, and I'll need to spam them non-stop until he's dead. Only problem is that a single boomerang takes up six hearts, and hearts are a non-renewable resource in battle, not without items anyway. Thankfully, there are items that restore hearts in battle, but again, they're random drops from enemies with low odds, and I'm gonna need a lot of them. There's a perfect spot for grinding for them, though. In the catacombs, there's a room with several coffins which spawn an infinite horde of mummies, which have a chance to drop heart restoratives, just called hearts in this game. They restore 10 hearts each, so like I said, I'm going to be here a while. I grind until I have about 50 and then attempt the boss again. Turns out, this is exactly what I needed. All I have to do is position myself in the right spot and start spamming until I'm out. Then pause the game, use my hearts, and spam some more. Rinse and repeat. Keep doing this until he's out, which does not take long at all. Apparently our friend Hugh isn't too happy about us killing it though. I mean, you had plenty of time to kill it while I was grinding for those hearts, and I would have been more than obliged. Oh, and the reward is the kick boots, the boots that let me wall jump. They don't make the entire castle accessible, but they do let you reach those spots that are just barely out of reach, and it's what I need to access the next area, the Eternal Corridor. And this is where the enemies are kinda starting to become a pain. First, I gotta go through this long series of hallways full of strong enemies like the Werebears and the Beast Demons, both of which take dozens of hits and deal a decent amount of damage, and then there are enemies that are just impossible to deal with like the Flame Demons. Things only get worse once I get into the Chapel Tower, because here I gotta deal with stuff like the bloody swords, which fly around in swarms and take a whole bunch of hits. Now, before too long I do get to the boss, but I do have some farming to do before I attempt it. The werebears here drop strength rings, which increase my strength by 50 at the cost of 10 defense and intelligence, which I'm gonna have to rely on if I actually wanna deal solid damage while staying at level one. There's also the knight suit, which isn't the most protective suit of armor at this point, but it does provide a strength bonus. It's also at this point I realize I can actually use Cheat Engine to level myself above 99, according to a post on Neoseeker. You can actually get up to level 161, which I do, and it definitely seems to help. I also get the Thunderbird card from the Were Panther, which will be important later on. Now, the boss here is a drama -like. This boss may look intimidating, but he's actually not that bad. For one thing, he's completely stationary, and his attacks are very easy to predict. He has this one attack where he shoots fireballs at you, which you can easily avoid if you just go to the corner of the arena, and one where he'll have a whole bunch of skulls sweep around him in this U-shaped pattern. You're most vulnerable to this attack when you're trying to hit him with your whip, but here I'm mostly using the boomerang, so avoiding them is much easier. There are also these poison bubbles coming out of the floor, but they can easily be taken care of with a single swing of the whip, and each of his attacks are doing about 60 damage. Even with all his HP, with my boomerangs doing 16 damage with each hit, taking him out does not take very long. We don't get anything for beating him, but we do find a button that destroys those Iron Maidens blocking the hallways that you may have seen earlier. Oh, and on the way out, we run into Hugian, who says the only reason we beat that boss was because of the power of the Vampire Killer Whip, even though I barely used the whip in that fight. But I make my way to the underground gallery, and surprisingly, the enemies here are actually easier to deal with than they were before. It may have something to do with the strength boost I got before the last boss, but most of them only go down in a few hits, and the ones that don't, like the giant bugs, are so slow it doesn't even matter. The only ones that pose any real threat are the harpies, which are the cause of many rewinds. 
All is well and mostly good until I get to the next boss, the zombie dragons. And now we are really in for it because this boss is one of the longest, most tedious, cheesiest, and painful bosses in the entire series, probably in this entire game. This boss is basically the menace from Dawn of Sorrow on steroids. The zombie dragon has a ton of HP, its attacks are very strong, are very hard to dodge, it has a very specific hitbox on only the head, and worst of all, there's two of them! Yeah, as if one of these things wasn't bad enough. As soon as I set foot into the arena for the first time, I just jump down, then get hit for over 100 damage by just touching one of these things. Each of these dragons likes to move their heads around in these slow but seemingly unpredictable motions. It's really difficult to explain. It's like it's slow, but also seemingly hard to dodge and hard to predict which move they're going to go for next. The one on the left shoots fireballs while the one on the right shoots electric balls at you. And they both do other things like bite and nudge you. And they'll also sometimes slam against the walls which will cause rocks to fall which damage you. What you're supposed to do is stand on top of the platforms in the middle and alternate between attacking and dodging them. But at this point, with me still being at level 1, these things are doing well over 100 damage with most attacks. Did I mention that they both have 1400 HP? This is pretty much a given by now, but I'm gonna have to do some more farming. This time for healing items again, and thankfully now, I don't have to just rely on the basic potions. The Gorgons in the Eternal Corridor drop meat, and when they don't drop that, they drop hearts. There's also ectoplasms that have a high chance to drop mine restores, which is always helpful. It's also at this point I realize I can actually grind myself up to level 999, which gives me 9999 in all stats, and it means that an item drop is pretty much guaranteed from every enemy. By the time I'm done, I have 36 meats, 55 mine restores, and a very nice 69 hearts. So, after like 20 failed attempts earlier, I attempt again, and this is where I figured out a slow and cheesy, but also effective strategy for this fight. You see, when you're standing on the platform, you're a sitting duck for most of their attacks, but if you crouch right under them, the one you're under can't actually attack you with anything other than his neck. The other one can, but only with their projectile attack. Personally, I'd recommend hiding under the left one because the other one's projectile attack is easier to dodge, and half the time the dragon seems to just launch it right above you anyway. As for the dragon that you're under, well, you are still susceptible to his neck touching you and the rocks falling. I'm pretty sure you're supposed to be able to block this by using your whip fan attack, but it seems that half the time the rocks just ignore that and hit you anyway, so it really just comes down to luck. As for attacking, well, your windows are very small and hitting it with the whip is less than ideal. The only real weapon you can rely on here is the axe, because it can be thrown upward. Oh, and I also forgot to mention, only focus on one at a time, for reasons that you'll see soon enough. Your best windows to attack are either while he's using the fireball attack, or when he's waving his head getting ready to use the wall slam attack. Don't take your eyes off the right one either, because you're still vulnerable to his projectile attack like I said earlier. This fight is very long and extremely tedious, and my axes are only doing 7 damage and usually only hit once, but sometimes hit twice or even 3 times if I'm lucky. But this strategy seems to get the job done because I am able to bring down the first dragon. Now, after you kill the first one, the other one will immediately start eating its body and gain back about 300 HP, which is why you only want to focus on one at a time. Even then, you may think that once you take one down, it'll get easier, but that's only partially true. For one thing, it now deals more damage, and I'm starting to run low on healing items. The axes also aren't as helpful for this part of the fight. The boomerang would probably be better, but I can only carry one sub-weapon at a time, so instead, I have to mostly rely on my whip. There is one spot where it can't reach me with any of its physical attacks, but I can still hit it when its head comes around. I also still have to worry about the rocks and the breath attack, which you'd think would be easier to dodge, but I am really starting to get tilted from fighting this boss, and there are a few times where I choke and take the hit for 170 damage. It's not long before my supply of meat runs dry, but if you have the Jupiter and Mandragora DSS cards, which I do, you can farm for unlimited healing items. If you stand in front of the door on the left side, the dragon can't hit you, so all you gotta do is stand here, heal up, and when your MP runs out, just wait for it to regenerate and heal again. It takes a while, and it's one of the reasons this fight takes so long, but if you don't have any healing items, it's really all you can do. I pretty much just keep repeating this process of attacking, then retreating and healing up for the remainder of the fight. It's a crude strategy, 
but it turns out to be just what I need to finish the job. And my reward is the heavy ring, allowing me to finally push those wooden blocks out of the way, allowing me access to the underground warehouse. And this is where I'm at the point where I'm opting to run past most of the enemies rather than fight them. My whip just isn't doing enough damage to them, and trying to kill them is more effort than it's worth. They are getting harder to avoid though, and the worst ones here are probably the poltergeists. Those enemies moving around really slowly and dying in one hit are some of the worst enemies here, because they send their objects flying across the screen at 100 miles an hour, and they're doing 80 damage. Not to mention, when I am able to kill the enemies, I'm seeing the level up notification almost every time. Without the rewind feature of the advanced collection, I don't know how I'd have gotten past this part. The boss at the end is death, but before I challenge him, there are some things I want to get first. I want to resupply on healing items, but most importantly, I want to get the Uranus card, which allows me to summon the monsters on the cards I have equipped. You get it from scary candles, which appear in the boss room of the machine tower after you beat the zombie dragons. Now, death here actually isn't too bad compared to his appearances in other Castlevania games. In fact, technically he's not even a mandatory boss. I completely missed him my first playthrough, but beating him will make the next part of the game much easier. His attacks, while strong, aren't hard to dodge, and bumping into him is hardly a problem. He spends most of the battle hovering above you, moving only in a horizontal direction, while sides are constantly flying at you. For his attacks, he launches bone tentacles from his body and launches two green balls of electricity. The strategy is to use the boomerang. Just jump and throw it. It's only doing six damage with each hit, and they usually hit twice, but sometimes more if I'm lucky. Another reason to use the boomerang is that it blocks the scythes, which mostly come from the top of the screen. Just keep throwing these until you get to his second form, where he turns into this weird zombie skeleton praying mantis turtle thing. In this form, he moves incredibly slowly, but his attacks hit a lot harder, and the floor also seems to have this weird quicksand effect, where sometimes I'll just be slowed down and have trouble jumping. He's a lot easier to hit now with the boomerangs, and he also has this ground pound where you'll take damage if you're just touching the ground. I could do this part normally, but seeing as how I just got this fancy new Uranus card, I might as well test that out on him. In order to get the summon to work, you have to do this weird half circle with the D-pad, then press B like something out of a fighting game. It's kind of weird, but with it you can pull off some very powerful attacks. And best of all, you're invincible while using them. The Cockatrice is the most powerful, so that's the one I'm going to be using here. All I have to do is just press L, do the move, pause the game, use some mind restores, and it's not long before I take out Death's second form. I go into the next room and get the Cleansing Necklace, which purifies the water in the underground waterway. Yeah, if you were trying to go through the underground waterway without it, you'd take damage for every second you're inside the water. Going through without it isn't impossible by any means, but for a level 1 challenge, it's not something I'd want to try. I gotta jump over some ice armors, activate some switches to get to the end, and at the end, I gotta fight Camilla. Probably the only boss besides Cerberus that I don't need to do a whole bunch of farming for. Mainly because if you have the right DSS combination, this fight is a complete joke, even at level 1. Camilla rarely ever attacks. She just kind of floats around on this skull thing, and while she does, these poisonous bubbles come after you. She also shoots lightning bolts toward the ground, but as long as you're on the platforms, you should be fine. When she does attack, she likes to use this one where she'll shoot what I think is wind at you, and if you get far enough away, she'll shoot a laser across the field, which you can easily avoid in most situations. And, for a late game boss, her attacks aren't even that strong. I say this fight is a joke because the idea is that the difficulty comes from having to juggle her attacks with the poison, but if you use the Jupiter and Manticore DSS combination, it creates a poison shield around you that stops these bubbles in their tracks. As long as that's active, these bubbles cannot hit you, and you can focus on taking out Camilla with the boomerang. It's doing exactly 10 damage to her with each hit, and because she's such a big target, getting more than two hits is extremely easy, and Camilla goes down in just a couple minutes.
The reward is the Rock Wing, allowing Nathan to do the super jump, making pretty much any part of the castle that's not blocked by an obstacle accessible, including the Observation Tower. On the way there, I meet the first enemy that can kill me in one hit from full health, the Fallen Angel, which I'm going to be trying hard to avoid if that wasn't obvious enough, along with the rest of the enemies around here like the Legions, the Dark Armors, and the Evil Pillars. Though once I get to the end, I backtrack to an earlier room to farm two strength arm bands from the Demon Lord. The accessory with the highest strength boost in the game, that being 100 at the cost of 25 defense and intelligence. Then I go back to the audience room to farm the dark armor, the item, not the enemy, from the Lilin, the highest defense armor piece in the entire game, which provides a bonus of 550. And finally, I go to the catacombs to get the Pluto card from the trick candle. You'll see why this is important in the boss fight. I head back, and it turns out the boss I have to fight is none other than one of the guys I came here with, Hugh Baldwin, and he's not happy. Now, the fight against Hugh is very similar to the fight against Julius from Aria of Sorrow, only instead of a whip, he uses a sword. He alternates between using sub-weapons like the boomerang, the axes, the knives, and the holy water. He also has a few special attacks, like one where he'll charge at you with his sword, and one where his sword will grow to this massive size and he'll swing at you. All these attacks are pretty easy to dodge and weak compared to some of the more recent bosses, but what makes this fight difficult is the stickiness of this game's controls. I haven't talked about this until now because it hasn't really been too much of a problem, but with Hugh being such a small target and with how fast he moves, it's really annoying when I'm just trying to dash away from him while he's chasing me, only for it to not work and I just get hit. This is why I needed the Pluto card, because when I use it with the Griffin card, it doubles my movement speed. Now, as for the fight itself, there's not a whole lot to say. Just avoid his attacks while spamming boomerangs. Don't think about which direction you're throwing them from, just throw them and then jump over them so they can come back to hit him. They're doing even more damage to him than they were to Camilla, but they don't hit as much because he's a much smaller target. Once you do enough damage to him, he'll turn red and his attacks will be the same, only slightly stronger and have a little bit longer range. But that's about it. He also has this new special attack where he'll shoot out some swords that chase at you, but you can block them. Of course, good luck trying to avoid his other attacks while also trying to block this one. I'd say this is the only attack that's really a problem, but I did bring along plenty of healing items and this attack isn't even all that strong anyway. Just keep throwing boomerangs as much as you can while whipping whenever it's convenient, and before too long, he will go down. My reward is the last key, which, as you'd expect, lets me access the last area that contains Dracula. And yes, you did hear me right. All you have to do to beat this game is to just beat the boss and get the key. You don't have to worry about any weird tricks or anything like that, but seeing as how this is the final boss, I think I should do some more farming first. A whole bunch of potion highs, and a whole bunch of heart restoratives. Once I get enough of those, there is only one thing left to do. Confront Dracula. We see that he's got Morris tied to a chair, and after some dialogue, we gotta fight him. The first phase of Dracula is pretty much a joke, and if you played any of the classic Castlevanias, you should already know how it goes. He teleports around the room, shoots some projectiles, in this case these weird elemental bats, and you gotta whip his head. I actually recommend using the whip and not the boomerang here because with how Nathan jumps, it's kinda hard to hit him in the head with the boomerang. Now, normally my whip is hardly doing anything, but the Venus-Thunderbird combination has an effect that increases your strength based on how much of the map you have registered, and seeing as how I'm at the end of the game, this boost is pretty good. Without it, my whip is only dealing 9 damage, but with it, it's doing 34, which is close to what I'd be doing if I were leveling up normally. It does drain my MP pretty fast, but I still have plenty of mine restores to help with that. His attacks are mostly easy to dodge, usually by jumping, but he does have one attack where he'll shoot out electric bats in all directions. If you're in the corner, they won't hit you, but if he catches you when you're trying to hit him, you're probably not going to be able to dodge this attack. All you gotta do is just cross your fingers and hope he doesn't go for it too much, and just keep whipping him till he's down. But of course, there's no way a final boss would be that easy, and defeating him just opens up a portal to where you have to fight his second form. What's cool though is that you don't immediately have to go in to fight him. You can go back and save or do any other preparations you may need. So I save the game, go in, and here Dracula takes on the form of this giant demon with an eyeball on his chest. Thankfully, this is a much easier target for the boomerang and usually takes multiple hits. 
Only problem is that you can only hit him while it's open, so I recommend spamming as many boomerangs as you can at a time. He alternates between three attacks, and which one he's using depends on where the flash comes from before he uses it. When the bottom part of his body flashes, he'll spit poison bubbles at you from those snake mouth things. These travel pretty slowly and can easily be blocked with your spin attack, so not much to worry about here. When his shoulders flash, he'll shoot lasers from the mouths of his shoulders that cause flames to rise up from the ground. It's pretty easy to avoid, but don't get caught off guard because to me, it's a one-hit kill. When he does this, I recommend using your super jump and just landing back on the platform while he's doing this. Lastly, and probably the worst attack, is the one where he'll summon a meteor shower to pellet you. It's not a one-hit kill, but much like the falling debris from the zombie dragons, there's pretty much no way to predict where they're going to come from, and they travel so fast that dodging them is pretty much out of the question. So, how do I deal with this? Well, remember how I was invulnerable while using my summons during the fight against death? That's exactly what I do here. As soon as I hear the meteors falling, I activate the summon, and it does even more to Dracula than it was doing to death. For a final boss, this is surprisingly easy. At least, that's what I was thinking until I got to the next phase, where he turned gray and charged at me, instantly killing me by dealing exactly 666 damage. Well, it's easy to get caught off guard by Dracula's attack in the third phase for the first time, but once you figure out his attack pattern, it's actually easier to dodge than his other attacks. All you have to do is use the super jump at the right time. He'll charge at you two to five times, then he'll turn into an eyeball surrounded by bats and start flying around. He's easy to avoid, but the real challenge is trying to hit him without also getting hit by the bats. The bats go down in just one hit, but hitting the eyeball with the whip while also taking no damage is almost impossible. The boomerangs aren't much good either because he flies around in an unpredictable motion. It also doesn't help that you have such a short time to attack before he goes back into his other form and starts charging at you again. Even spamming summons doesn't work because they only deal damage to enemies when they're on screen. At least that's true with the exception of the Thunderbird. Yeah, the Uranus-Thunderbird combination may not be the strongest, that's the Cockatrice, but the Thunderbird combo is the only one that hits enemies when they're off screen. So what I do is, when he changes into his eyeball form, as soon as I see him I activate the summon, and thankfully because of the sound it makes, I can tell that he's taking damage. Each hit is dealing sometimes 10, but usually 14 damage, and this move hits around 4 to 8 times. It does drain a pretty hefty 200 MP, but I still have a whole bunch of mind highs and mind restores, and with this strategy, the second part of the fight is a complete joke. It isn't too long before Dracula goes down. He tells us he's never truly going to be gone, Nathan tells him he'll be there to stop him when he comes back, the castle crumbles, and everyone makes it out safe and sound. And then, the credits roll. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Castlevania Circle of the Moon. So, can you beat Castlevania Circle of the Moon while at level 1? Well, kinda. While I was able to play through the entire game and beat all the bosses at level 1, I did still use an external program to modify my level for purposes of grinding. Circle of the Moon is a very RNG heavy game, and if you're trying to get the best equipment legitimately, it's going to require more farming than Harvest Moon. So is it possible to get all the items I got while always staying at level 1? Yes, but it just requires an ungodly amount of patience. But let me know what you guys thought of this video. I know a lot of people want me to go back to Persona and SMT videos, which, don't worry, I will be doing. I'm currently working on my Eternal Punishment starting Persona's only video, but seeing as how it is still October, I do want to primarily focus on Castlevania right now. Let me know if you all have any ideas for other Castlevania challenges in the future. As always, be sure to check out my other links in the description and consider supporting me financially on Ko-Fi. Till the next video, I will see you all later.